Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It, it's a great pleasure this evening to introduce to you Peter Sutherland to deliver the fourth lecture in our series Leadership in a Time of Transition uh, and Tabulance. Peter is one of the best known Irishmen of his generation and widely recognized as an international businessman and an expert on world trade. He's currently the non-executive chairman of Goldman Sachs International and also the UN Special Representative for Migration. One of the reasons that I have inv invited Peter to address us this evening is the sheer breadth of his leadership position that he's held over the course of a fascinating life across such a wide range of different fields, including business, law, politics, and academia. It makes him a very rare breed indeed, and uniquely positioned to offer us his wisdom and experience as we consider the topic of leadership in these troubled times. A barrister by profession, at the age of 34, Peter became the youngest ever Attorney General of Ireland. Four years later, he was appointed to the European Commission, where he became the youngest ever European Commissioner. I think you begin to see the trend. And while in his position at the European Commission, he had responsibility for competition policy, and later also for education, where he helped to establish the Erasmus program for European students. After his time in Brussels, he became the chairman of Allied Irish Banks, where he stayed for four years. In 1993, he became the director general of the General Agreement on Tra Tariffs and Trade, which soon after became the World Trade Organization. And Mickey Cantle, the former US Trade Minister, credited Peter with being the father of globalization and said that without him, there would have been no WTO. Since then, Peter's held positions as a director of RBS, non-executive chairman of BP, and has sat on the boards of numerous businesses and institutions, including NatWest, Ericsson, ABB, Allianz, the World Economic Forum, the Trilateral Commission, the European Institute, the European Roundtable of Industrialists, and the Advisory Council of Business for New Europe, and I'm missing out many. Peter has also been the visiting fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, visiting professor at University College Dublin, and holds honorary doctorates from 15 universities worldwide. In 2008, he took up the position as chair of the LSE Council. In 2006, he was also appointed consultor of the extraordinary section of the administration of the patrimony of the apostolic see. For those of you who are wondering what on earth that might be, I think translated into the vernacular, it means that he's a financial advisor to the Vatican. Peter is well known for his pro-European position, and he makes no bones about it, and apparently describes the worst thing about his time battling with throat cancer in 2009 as missing the mortal combat of fighting for the yes vote in the second Lisbon referendum. Peter has also been deeply involved in the challenges surrounding the Irish economy this year, advising the government and comment wide, commenting widely in the press. Despite all the challenges, he still holds an optimistic view, arguing in a recent interview with Bloomberg that although Ireland's problems will take a number of years to overcome, buoyant exports and manufacturing growth shows that the country will be able to face the appallingly difficult challenges. In his capacity as an expert on world trade, Peter has recently been asked by the governments of Germany, Britain, Turkey, and Indonesia to assess the prospects for the Doha Round and the World Trade Organization. He is convinced that the Doha Round must be concluded this year and that failure to do so will make it impossible to bring to a close for a period of years given the inevitable paralysis of global trade negotiations following the US presidential elections next year. Writing recently in the Financial Times, Peter said, It is surely clear that a failure of the round would undermine the credibility of the whole institution and so increase the likelihood of a protectionism and the erosion of the rule-based system, which has been an essential element in globalization. It has also mitigated the worst effects of the recent financial crisis and provided a bulwark against the protectionism that might well have ensued. If we are serious about interdependence and development, we need to reinforce multilateralism. 
concluding the round is an acid test of whether we have the collective will to do so. Peter has the most extraordinary breadth of experience and over his lifetime he has faced a number of personal hardships and difficulties and extraordinary challenges of leadership which he has um, taken on uh, and which he has prevailed in. I can't think of anyone better from such a wide background to talk to us tonight uh, on these turbulent times and what leadership really is and how it is needed to work in a world that has become so changed so rapidly. It's a very real honor for me to have uh, Peter here and I ask you to give him a warm round of approval. Well, first of all, Ken, thank you very much for that um, truncated and understated uh, introduction. <laughs> I, there was somebody far more eminent than I who once said, having listened to such an introduction, that he was glad that it came to an end because he found it difficult to remain humble looking for any prolonged period of time. And I must say I shared that with, with the person in question. But um, I'm delighted actually to give this evening's uh, lecture. You may not be because in a sense I'm going to continue with a, a, a personal exegesis on my own experiences rather than uh, drawing a lot of conclusions from them because I've been fortunate in my life to live through a number of trauma traumatic moments which were influenced by others who provided leadership rather than myself. And when I was asked to deliver this evening's lecture, I was told that I should reflect on my personal experiences in relation to leadership and who I've seen during that period. That inevitably brings together not merely individuals, but causes. And I suppose that I can admit to being a man who's believed in causes all his life. I have always had uh, ideas that I wish to fulfill and I've always had mountains that I wish to climb. And um, I decided, and no doubt to your life, that I would, uh, to your delight, that I wouldn't dwell upon the various theories of leadership itself. One study often cited, uh, that of Professor Byrd in 1940, cited 79 characteristics of a good leader. And uh, Marx and Hegel, were of the view that circumstances created leaders rather than any talents that they innately had themselves. And there's some evidence that seems to support that. If you take the life of Churchill as an example, I think many historians might accept, and indeed some have, that if events had not led to the crisis which defined the life of Winston Churchill, he might have gone down in history as a rather inadequate politician who had been involved in a number of events which were not greatly to his credit and which in fact caused some damage and indeed in the First World War, loss of life. But the events which brought him to the leadership position that he occupied during the Second World War made him one of the greatest men of the century from any country in the world. So in a sense, there is something to be said for the argument that it's the conjuncture of a time, a place, and a particular situation with the characteristics of particular individuals that creates a capacity to lead. Then there are different approaches to leadership. Plato, Machiavelli, Chairman Mao, all of them wrote about leadership and they had different political theories about what it meant and how it should be developed and how it has influenced the events of their time. There are different approaches to. General Patton famously said that if you want to find me, you'll always find me in the first tank. Robespierre, on the other hand, is alleged to have said as the mob swept past during the French Revolution, quickly let me through I have to follow them because I'm their leader. And uh, <clears throat> I think that the Robespierre view of uh, leadership is the more prevalent one with most politicians, much though they might wish to deny it. 
Um, talking of the French Revolution, it's also worth um, bearing in mind as a health warning at the beginning of the few words that I'm going to express to you that uh, the following anecdote, which is a true anecdote, and it covers the return of Napoleon from Elba in a French newspaper called Le Moniteur, which was a daily Parisian newspaper, and it covered the headlines of that trip. And uh, the headlines were as follows. On the 9th of March, uh, 1815, the beast has left its lair. On the 11th, the Corsican monster has set foot on French soil. On the 13th, the torturer spent the night in Grenoble. The 18th, the tyrant is marching towards Dijon. The 20th, Bonaparte wants to conquer Paris. Will he succeed? The 20th, the emperor has already reached Fontainebleau. The 21st, the liberator is pounding at the gates of the capital. The 22nd, his imperial majesty marched into Paris today. And the 23rd, vive l'empereur. And I suppose it proves that a week is a long time in politics <laughs> and that perceptions of leaders can change depending on the political events that surround them at any given moment of time. I suppose that in my life I can say that I've been inspired by a number of individuals and I've been very lucky to have worked with them and their leaders and people who have shown leadership ability in the face of great difficulty and great challenges and leadership which is of a dimension which is really worth noting. The first of them I'm going to pass rapidly over because the events with which he was concerned are events which wouldn't be of great interest to this audience or to an international audience and that was in my own country where I served as Attorney General in two governments of Garrett Fitzgerald, who remains to this day at the age of 84 a vibrant intellectual force in my own country. And we had to go through in the early 80s dreadful challenges with the IRA, where we were under constant pressure uh, of a kind which uh, I don't enjoy recalling. But I saw how people reacted under pressure at that time. I remember the British Embassy being burnt to the ground. That was immediately before we came into office. And I remember saying at the time we came into office that that dreadful event could never be allowed to happen again. And during the term of office, when I was in uh, the role of Attorney General, there was another march on the British Embassy, which at this stage had moved to another premises. And there was a determination on our part that under no circumstances could that embassy be burned to the ground. But we were faced with the possibility that the marchers, instead of marching to Balls Bridge, where the embassy was located, might instead have turned up Kildare Street and occupied the Parliament. And there were limited resources available to deal with this in terms of the armed forces of the state or the police because many of those who were protesting were being bussed down in large numbers from Northern Ireland. And this raised challenges which fortunately didn't come to a head because the thin blue line of policemen actually resisted the attacks that came on them. But it called for great leadership at that time to withstand many of the pressures which we were going through. And uh, we came through, we came through it, uh, and I think we came through it because we had a leadership in my country which had to withstand even greater pressures than the pressures we visited through our countrymen and some of the outrages that were committed here in Britain. But I can assure you that it sometimes is not easy to be in government. It's not easy to be in a security committee, on a security committee, uh, at a time like that, as I was with the Prime Minister, Minister for Defence, and the Minister for Justice. And um, we went through difficulties too, 
in terms of legislative proposals that brought forward great tension. For an example, there was a movement at that time to include in the Constitution a total prohibition on abortion. And the wording that was put forward was held by me to be ambiguous. It had been accepted by the previous government and was to be put to a referendum. And we had to try to withdraw the amendment from the referendum. Our own political party split, half voting with the opposition, as a result of which we ended up in the paradoxical situation where the Prime Minister and most of his ministers were arguing against a referendum which was being put to the people in terms of uh, this particular issue. I won't go into the details of it, suffice it to say that I saw the pressures that were brought to bear and can be brought to bear in a, a situation of that kind where people believe on both sides of the issue that they have a unique moral insight in regard to uh, the issue in question. And you can imagine how difficult an issue that was in a country which is uh, as Catholic as Ireland was at that time, although perhaps less so because of recent scandals in current times. So I've been inspired by a small number of great leaders in my time. And the two that I will focus on uh, have their detractors, particularly perhaps in this country. But before referring to them, let me say something of my time and how I came to interface with them. The two individuals that I will refer to are Helmut Kohl and Jacques Delors. I've always believed that the most noble political project of our time is the project of European integration. And of, of all of the political events that I have been engaged in in my life, the, ones that have, um, the one that has emotionally affected me most has been that. I know that here there is a different view, a different view overwhelmingly felt according to the polls of Eurobarometer in Great Britain in a way which is in fact quite unique. Even the Scandinavian countries who have a reputation for skepticism about Europe are nothing like in the same position as public opinion here. There may be many different reasons for that. Britain has never been invaded effectively since the Norman invasion. Britain has fought many wars on the continent. Perhaps even there is a sense of the reformation <coughs> about attitudes in Britain, that the continent is an alien place in different ways. And sometimes I must say, as a person who greatly respects the country which has been so generous to me, I have been disturbed by the stereotypes that are sometimes expressed about continental Europeans by some of the tabloids in particular in this country. The French are described in one way the Germans are described in another. My own country is described in one way, usually with a humorous smile rather than a critical comment. But nonetheless, stereotypes seem to be more part of life than they ought to be. Jacques Delors <coughs> became a crucial part of my life when I was nominated, probably like Sir Thomas More, I was a turbulent priest who was to be moved out of Ireland after a turbulent time as Attorney General, but I was asked by my Prime Minister to become the Irish Commissioner in Brussels. And uh, the four years that I spent there with Jack Delors were a vitally important part of my life. Sometimes people wonder here why it is that those who were sent to Brussels go native, as so many have done. <coughs> Every commissioner that has gone from this country that I can recall on his return after four years is a transformed personality in terms of their attitude to Europe. And I think that the reason is, certainly the reason for me why it was important, was that I saw a nobility of purpose however ineffective it may be 
in practice, a nobility of purpose in taking on and challenging nationalism, which is the core rationale for the existence of European integration. It was founded following the Second World War on a philosophical base. I was struck when I went first to Paris to meet Jacques Delors before he became president or before I became a commissioner, but in the immediate aftermath of our selection, I had lunch with him in a restaurant called Chez Edgar off Avenue Montaigne in Paris. And he asked me why I was a European, or was I a European? And I told him I was. And I remember him telling me that he had been inspired by a Christian philosopher, Emmanuel Mounier, and Jacques Maritain, another philosopher, who wrote immediately following the Second War, Second World War, who in turn had inspired at that time the founders of the European movement, Jean Monnet, de Gasperi from Italy, Adenauer from Germany, and Schumann, above all, from France. And these men were all driven by a moral vision, and they said it. They said it from the very beginning that that was what inspired them. And that inspiration was evident throughout the course of those early years. The Congress of The Hague in the late 40s, the creation of the coal and steel community, and later the, in, in 1951, and later the Treaty of Rome, which came into existence following the Council of Messina, which at the time Rab Butler described, he was asked what all of the other Europeans were down there, doing down there in Messina in Sicily. And he said he supposed that they were on an, an archaeological excavation. Well, he may have thought they were on an archaeological excavation, but the reality was that they were laying the seeds for something that inspired Jacques Delors and still inspires him as a man in his mid-80s today, and I still serve on, a found, on his foundation in Paris. And he was driven by a belief in an integration between peoples, which, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, cannot be disputed to be other than a noble idea. It, George Canning, in a speech in remark actually in 1826 following the collapse of the Congress of Vienna which had sought to create a certain harmony in Europe made the comment that he said after the collapse things are back to a wholesome state every nation for itself and God for us all if you ponder those words you have to recognize the irony of what he was saying. Far from it being God for us, all, for us all, what he really welcomed was something which should have brought the retort, God help us all. Because what was to happen? The Prussian War, the First World War, the Second World War, all between Europeans and when, after the war, the Second World War, an attempt was made through the Congress of The Hague, first of all, there was a meeting, I should say, again, evidence of leadership in turbulent times. On the island of Ventotene, Spinelli, a figure that probably is not known, a name that is probably not known to many of you, Altiero Spinelli, uh, was imprisoned by uh, Mussolini. And he wrote on that island, while in prison, having been tortured, he wrote a document called the Ventotene Manifesto. During 
after a period of four or five years, but whilst still Italy was under the boot of the fascist powers, he was released. And a group in 1944 of resistance leaders met in Switzerland. And they were the ones who really started the European integration movement. Because even though at that stage it was apparent that the war would end by the Allies succeeding, there was no hint of the attitude which had followed World War I and which made World War II inevitable of recrimination and the reparations which brought Germany to its knees and gave birth ultimately to Hitler and fascism. There was no hint of that, quite the reverse. <coughs> Immediately after the war, these leaders were the ones who, as I say, inspired by philosophers, not by pragmatists or people who were trying to make the argument on economic grounds that a single Europe would be better economically for them. But that drove these people into a position where they believed that they could lead Europe in coming together, peoples coming together, peoples coming together and not fighting each other. And the beginnings of the European Union were, of course, there was, of course, the coal and steel community, which was to share coal and steel production because coal and steel were the basic implements required for war, for the power to power war or to make armaments. And that's what, that's what it was brought in to do. And the coal and steel community created a mechanism where sharing sovereignty, no one state could act on its own. Now that took inspiration and leadership in turbulent times to confront the nationalism which existed, no doubt, in the countries that had had to take on Hitler and fight Hitler, not to seek to wield the same degree of power against a defeated Germany that had happened in the past. And the generosity of spirit that was behind this, and I'm not trying to make an argument here for Christianity, but I think it was related to Christianity. I think it was related to the virtues of Europe for what they're worth, which are built out of Christianity, or if you're a humanist, you can say the Enlightenment, but they are based on principles which are linked to the dignity of man and the equality of man. And those were the principles that underpinned, for better or for worse, the experiment which was to become the European experiment. Britain had, of course, a different position. It had a commonwealth. It had ties to other parts of the world. It always believed that its interests were in free trade. But it has never been persuaded that the best way to govern is to share sovereignty. Perhaps the intimacy of the French, the Germans, and the Italians with war, which was, if anything, more intimate a connection, however terrible, than that of Britain, drove them to new thinking, which could not be taken here. And when Winston Churchill went to Zurich and gave his famous speech in Zurich University, he made it clear that Britain favored European integration, but not with Britain as part of it, but rather, as he described it, acting as a bridge between Europe and the United States, which is the old story of the special relationship, a special relationship which Americans today seem to say would be better exercised by Britain being at the heart of Europe than by being semi-detached from it. And that logic, that logic, 
has driven the British position ever since. But it's not the position, I must say, which I hold. And it's certainly not the position that was held by either of the heroes that I believe influenced me most, namely Jacques Delors and Helmut Kohl. I remember that day in Shea Edgar when Jacques Delors said to me, with a wry smile, he said, what we're going to do and have as a theme for this first commission is a very specific one. We're going to try to create a functioning internal market, free movement of goods, persons, capital and services by 1992. And he said that one of the strongest advocates of this, for once, if I may say so, on the positive side of the argument vis-a-vis -vis Europe, was the United Kingdom. And that's why it appealed to him as an idea. It, of course, appealed to the United Kingdom because it was the crystallization of a pragmatic rather than an airy-fairy ideal, as is often described as some of the European thinking. Here was something practical, and something that fitted in with the British concern about free markets and opening of markets. But I think that Jack Delors had a somewhat different intention to that expressed at that time by Lady Thatcher, or Mrs. Thatcher as she was. Because he recognized, and I remember saying, him saying it to me almost in a conspiratorial way, that the only way that you could ever have an internal market was by having more European legislation. And that the only way you could have more European legislation binding member states was by having more majority voting. And if you have majority voting, which can outvote individual member states, you are attacking the very core of national sovereignty, which is exactly what Jack Delors intended to do. And ultimately, it became apparent that he was right. <coughs> he was an intellectual driven by what he often described as a moral view. He constantly referred, and I had never even heard of him when he mentioned it first, to this man, Emmanuel Mounier who had been a Christian socialist during the period between the two wars. And that was driving him to a view, not merely that European integration was desirable, but that the more you could have sharing of sovereignty and the voting across, across the interests of individual member states by majority voting, the more you would get that integration. And of course, when inexorably the logic of this came through and the single European Act, which was the act which provided for this majority <coughs> voting, was adopted. Ironically, it was adopted during the time of Maggie Thatcher. And I remember going to Luxembourg at that time when the vital meeting was taking place to finally agree the text. And I couldn't understand how Maggie Thatcher could possibly agree to it. But I, nor could I understand how she could possibly disagree with it, because it was the only way that she could get the internal market, which had become the leitmotif of her position in regard to Europe. So in the end, she agreed to it. And of course, to this day, it is thrown up against the Eurosceptics in the Conservative Party as being the defining moment. Uh, a defining moment which, the great irony of all, was the moment when Lady Thatcher, Thatcher or Margaret Thatcher as she was, agreed with this proposal. In parenthesis, I must say that there was another ironic moment which I shouldn't, uh, because I, in many ways I admire, uh, Lady Thatcher, I shouldn't perhaps laugh at this, but it was difficult not to be amused. At the time, I was commissioner for competition, and uh, I remember one day shaving in my uh, house in, 
Brussels <clears throat> and listening to the news, and there was a G7 or G5 or whatever it was at the time meeting taking place in Toronto. And I had uh, been a rather turbulent priest in Brussels as well as in Dublin, and I had blocked the rover, British rover uh, takeover, British Leyland um, takeover. And I had also been rather difficult over the merger of um, the Scottish airline, I can't remember the name of the uh, Scott, Caledonian and BA. And Mrs. Thatcher hadn't enjoyed this and she, she, she was asked something about interest rates on the radio and as I was shaving she said, oh I don't want to talk about interest rates, she said I want to talk about that man in Brussels. <laughs> And of course, I'm afraid it was me, but I had, I, had, I had the revenge of at least being able to laugh at the following situation. When she came to give her famous Bruges speech, uh, in which was the denunciation of, of, of all things European, uh, she um, gave it in the, British, in the European University Institute in Bruges, and um, uh, it was in a very ancient hall and the rector of the university was a German who was a very much a European integrationist. And uh, when she finished uh, her speech, out of four speakers in the hall came the blaring movement of Ode to Joy, the European national anthem. And Mrs. Thatcher immediately with her ambassador jumped to attention with everybody else standing she thinking, as it transpired, that she was standing to the Belgian national anthem. <laughs> Whereas the rest of us, with tears rolling down our face, were, <coughs> were standing to the European national anthem. But having said that, Lady Thatcher was also a great leader. Whether you agree or disagree with her position, she was a great leader. And she was a great leader because she combined the various qualities that I think that are necessary for leadership, vision, resilience, courage. The other two, perhaps one can question how much she, how good she was at them, teamwork and communication. But to an extent, she had kept at least her own, her own team together. And um, <clears throat> during that period, um, uh, for me, it was the defining period of my life, those four years, because I had taken the competition brief precisely because I was a constitutional lawyer, not an economist. And I saw in it that I had powers as a commissioner for competition that directly affected national sovereignty. For an example, there is the power to stop state subsidies being paid by to an industry in one country by the government, which has the revenue from its own taxation to pay the money. It's a very direct infringement of national sovereignty <coughs> to say to that government, you cannot spend your money on your own industry because the effect is to beggar thy neighbor. And that power, of course, led one into some terrible battles including anecdotally a battle I had with a steelworks called Bagnoli. I spent four years trying to close Bagnoli. Bagnoli was outside Naples and it was the most egregious example of money being passed by governments under tables, over tables and in every conceivable way to keep a factory going which was of course affecting competition elsewhere. And. Uh, uh, I remember the first time uh, I went down uh, as a new commissioner and I was told that either I stopped the money going to Bagnoli or there was going to be chaos in the European Council and it was an earth-shattering event. So I remember arriving at the Via Veneto to the Department of Industry in Italy and walking up the stairs to be met by a very naturally dressed Secretary General called Baratieri. And Barrettieri said, uh, do you mind, Commissioner, first of all, congratulations, he said, on your appointment. Secondly, do you mind waiting for a moment? And I said, not at all. And he said, um, I said, what, is there a problem? Is there? No, he said, you're not meeting one minister. He said, you're meeting two. Because wherever you meet a minister in one, other con one minister in any other country, you meet at least two here. 
and the two ministers in question that you're meeting, one for the public service and the other for industry, they're in a room, he said, over there, and you want to know what they're doing? I said, yes, what are they doing? He said, they're fighting about what they're going to say to you. <laughs> now, that was a bit different from my experience of uh, civil servants elsewhere, and ultimately we went into a room and after a, a display of histrionics, which I, I've never equaled, banging tables and shouting and screaming and telling them that they're going to destroy Europe and everything else, dead, I was met by a deadly silence on the other side of the table. And at the end of about an hour of this, I ran out. There was nothing more to say. And, and then one of the ministers um, had the delightful name of Signor Altissimo. Signor Altissimo looked at his watch and he said, do you know, he said, it's time for lunch. <laughs> let's 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 de let's depart," he said, "for my for my club. It's a hunt, hunting man's club," he said. "It's wonderful." So we went. Nothing more was said of it. I got on the plane. And I said to my German director general, "I said that must be the biggest disaster of a commission meeting you've ever attended." Oh no, he said it was absolutely wonderful. I never I never saw anyone so annoyed, and this was magnificent. You were really it was fabulous, fabulous. Well, I said, we didn't get anywhere. Oh, yes, we did. Well, I said, I don't think we did. Nobody said anything. Don't worry. He said, they'll capitulate at the council next week. And as soon as they capitulate, he said, um, everybody will be delighted. They'll go home. And then two weeks later, they'll start it all over again. Oh, I said, my God. <laughs> and, and, so, and, and, so, and so it was to transpire. And four years later, after a numerous uh, rehearsals of precisely the same thing, Bagnoli was still operating, and when I went home to my house in, in Dublin, <coughs> and this is the, the great thing about Europe, I received uh, some days later a, a knock at the door, and I opened the door, and there was a postman there with a box. I didn't know what this was, and, and I saw Naples. I wondered, was it a bomb? But in any event, I brought it in, and I opened it up, and there was a most, most magnificent steel uh, set of chessmen, which still... Uh, is in my, my living room. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful work. And there was a little note, and the note said, from the workers and management of Bagnoli, farewell. <laughs> so farewell it was. And uh, <coughs> that, was, that, was, that was the end of that. But I, I, at the same time, I remember Helmut Kohl. And Helmut Kohl was very different from uh, Jacques Delors. He was a rough-hewn man. He's still alive, as Jacques is, but in not, not in good health. He was tough. He was anything but an intellectual. But he was driven in a messianic way by a belief in the same thing that Delors was driven by. And it was a coincidence of time. He absolutely believed, and believes to this day, in European integration at any price to Germany. And I remember at a particular stage of those turbulent times, having a, a meeting of the European Council, where part of the quid pro quo for the Single European Act, which, as I've explained to you, introduced more majority voting, the other quid pro quo to creating a single market was that in some way you'd look after the poor, the poorer countries a little more. There'd be more structural funds, as they were called, to be dispersed to countries like my own, uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece, and so on, and poorer parts of, of the richer countries as well. And to do that, they had to double the structural funds as part of the overall bargain. And of course, <clears throat> the persons who were paying then were the same as the people who are paying now, basically Germany. And uh, I remember it very well because uh, Jacques Delors uh, occasionally would take a couple of glasses of a diabolical potion called um, Fernier Branca, who some of you may know, which I thought was for hangovers, but he used to have it for lunch. And, um, um, one or two glasses of this was enough to send any normal person into, into uh, orbit. And uh, he arrived back on the, uh, to the commission meeting, which was preceding 
the council of ministers meeting that was prime ministers that was to take place that evening and I remember him coming into the room and looking around the room because we all feared the worst about getting this doubling of the structural funds and he said I can tell you he said that by this time tomorrow I will have resigned and this mark you I must tell you was not the first time that we had heard that he was going to resign but this time he sounded even more serious than usual and he said and then he said and there is nobody in this room looking disparagingly at the rest of us who is going to resign with me except you Peter me <laughs> I, said, I said no I'm not I'm no. and of course my my one of my British colleagues uh, <clears throat> Stanley Clinton Davis was making signals to me that I was um, out on my own but in any event that night Jack Delore I remember came back and I had dinner with him late that evening uh, the two of us and he said to me I said how did it go he said well it went fine at a vital moment and we were clearly going to lose because the Germans were not prepared to pay uh, they'd had enough they'd been paying from the beginning and they're paying incidentally to this day and uh, I could see it was going wrong and Jack spoke a bit of German and I said what happened well he said I went round the table to Helmut Kohl and I said you can't do this Helmut and Helmut looked at me and he said Jacques do I really have to do this for Europe because it could be the political my political end and Jacques told me that he said to him yes you do have to do it for Europe and he brought his fist down the table and he said Germany will pay and Germany did pay and he did go through a lot of difficulty in his own country again it was evidence of 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 leadership and uh, this part of my life four years was to influence me greatly in what happened subsequently because subsequently and I think the British government had something to do with it I was asked to become uh, director general of GATT which was to become the World Trade Organization to try to conclude the Uruguay round as it was then and to create a World Trade Organization and that to me was the fulfillment of an, Im of an idea which one of the founders of the European Union had held dear Jean Monnet who always believed that European integration was a first step towards global governance and the creation of the WTO would have been and was to be indeed the one great move that had taken place since the inspired period of institution building and in the immediate post-war period that created the IMF and the World Bank but then rejected because of the Americans a World Trade Organization this was to be the moment when it was to take place and uh, I was asked one night in uh, Brussels having dinner with Mickey Cantor who was the American uh, Minister for Trade to have breakfast the following morning with Leon Britton who was the European Commissioner for Trade and I knew before I went to the meeting it wasn't didn't take a genius to know what they were going to ask me I was chairman of a bank at the time and <coughs> I was asked and I said to I remember saying to Mickey Cantor uh, Mickey why would I in my right mind take on the job of uh, Director General of GATT when you've had seven years of negotiation and no sign that that negotiation is going to bring come to a happy conclusion and I remember him saying look into my eyes when I tell you this and I said I will and I looked into his eyes and he said I know that you don't go down in history for failing to reach agreements my president knows that you don't go down in history for failing to reach agreements and I'm telling you that we will bring this round home if you come and uh, it wasn't dependent on my coming I suppose I'm expressing it in a rather uh, personalized way but when you come you will see that we will deliver 
we will deliver. And it was showing a leadership which I should say is not so evident today from Mr. Obama in regard to the Doha round because the evidence which was being given there was evidence that they were going to get this across the line, come what may. And for me, Jean Monnet's vision of a Europe integrating, being part of a world integrating, was something which was remarkable. And that's why I went. And at the same time, Cole, with another feet of leadership had grabbed the opportunity of uniting Germany when the Russians were unclear as to their position and the West, Western Europeans were unclear of their support for German unification. Certainly they were unsure in France. They were not generous in their response. They were doubtful and were expressing their doubts about a resurgent Germany which is united. And the same fears, more muted, were being expressed here. And he grabbed that. He brought down the border. He caused the collapse of the border. When I went to the WTO, I remember going to his house in Bonn because not for the first time, we were having trouble with the French. We couldn't get the French to agree to the agricultural part of the liberalization that was required to conclude the Uruguay round and create a World Trade Organization. And I went to try to inveigle Mr. Cole into agreeing to pressurize in one way or another the French and I remember him sitting there, and he didn't speak English, and he didn't speak French. So he was true an interpreter, and he pointed to a portrait of Adenauer on the wall. And he said, I went into politics for four reasons. And they were the four reasons that drove that man. And we were driven by the same motivation. I had seen members of my family die in a war and I was determined it would never happen again. And the four reasons, he said, that I went into politics were German unification, which we've achieved. Secondly, European integration based upon the Franco-German axis. Thirdly, he said, free trade, because I believe that it helps Germany. And fourthly, the German-US relationship. But he said, if you're asking me to threaten what for me now is the most important of those, namely European integration, by publicly criticizing the French, I won't do it. He said, I won't do it because that is the thing above all that I believe in. I believe in European integration. I also believe in free trade, but I cannot go further than trying to help you in the background. And he said, <clears throat> we'll keep in touch, as we did, and I will try and help. And I remember paying clandestine visits subsequently to Paris to try to uh, get the French Balladur, in particular, who was prime minister, over the line. And I know that it was the leadership in this case, uncharacteristically, quietly displayed by Cole, and also by a man for whom I have great fondness, who did a great deal quietly in his own, in his own way, John Major. They were the ones who helped that to happen. Finally, Clinton. And we all signed, we all went to Marrakesh, where we created the World Trade Organization. No sooner had we created the World Trade Organization than we had to <coughs> recognize, which perhaps we hadn't fully recognized, that it existed because 140 countries all turned up and signed and agreed everything. 
but the American agreement was subject to ratification by Congress. And some weeks later, I was told I had to go to Congress to try and convince them that it was in America's interest to join the organization which they had blocked the creation of in the 1949 to 51 period previously. But Mickey Cantor lived up to his promise because he faced down, he faced down his own worst uh, enemies, uh, enemies of free trade in the United States. He did take risks and his boss took risks and they also did something which was unique. Why was it unique? It wasn't unique because we had marches against us in Seattle, in Cancun, marches against free trade, marches against globalization, which to me is a morally desirable, a morally desirable outcome morally desirable because it is based upon equality of opportunity. It's based upon avoiding the mercantilism of the past and the domination of the rich by the rich of the poor. It was perceived by many to be the opposite. Many NGOs, friends of the earth, and so on, were violently opposed to the creation of the WTO. They were violently opposed to globalization. Where are they now? There are no voices raised against the existence of the World Trade Organization. The poorer countries of the world are the ones who have gained most by having a rule-based system which allows them the equality on the global trading floor that they were lacking throughout centuries of various forms of imperialism. They have law and rules on their side. They have a right to be involved in their own decision-making processes in a way which never existed before. And the World Trade Organization no longer has Cancun or Seattle demonstrations. It's no longer the bete noir of uh, international organizations. In fact, <clears throat> the Doha round, which struggles on, and which I'm still, as was explained, engaged with on behalf of, appointed by Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Cameron, incidentally, living up to the historic positions of, of Cole and, and Major in continuing to support this movement. Um, they, uh, that round is a round which is meant to be about development. It's about to be, it's meant to be about helping developing countries. And I think it's doing so. Um, so, two very dissimilar men. Final point I would make about the WTO is that the WTO uh, was the mechanism that allowed for the integration of China into the global nations of the world. I went to China a number of times. The Chinese application I always remember. It was a clear, unambiguous statement by China that they recognized that the command economy and the lack of freedom in economic terms for individuals meant no competition and no growth. And they explicitly said that they recognized that they had to open up in a way that they had never done before, which I've always seen as a precursor to political liberalization as well. And <clears throat> I remember going and speaking to Zhang Zemin about this, and he fully understood it. And that's what they wanted. And uh, that integration and the liberalization, too slow in my view, but nonetheless the liberalization of command economies and over-regulated economies like India has worked massively to the advantage of these people. The Human Security Report of the United Nations, which I subsequently was involved in writing, established the total numbers that have been brought out of abject poverty by trade 
Admittedly, some parts of the world did not benefit from this. Africa, sub-Saharan Africa in particular. But Asia, in Asia, one and a half to two billion people were brought out of abject poverty within a number of, a relatively short number of years. And it continues apace. And that has come from the opening of borders rather than the closing of borders. The reason that Africa hasn't successfully participated is partially related to political structures. It's partially related to the lack, and mostly related to the lack of human infrastructure and physical infrastructure to allow them to do it. It's not that globalization has damaged them. It is that globalization has passed them by because they're unable to participate in it. But <clears throat> that period of the 90s will, when written, by, written up by historians, will be described as a golden period. A period when, following the collapse of the Iron Curtain, everybody aspired to the same, at least in name, to the same type of economic society and to a, an integration and interdependence that had never existed before. Whether we can withstand the pressures on it today will also be down to leaders and whether we have those leaders. But we had them in the 90s. We did things in the 90s, which I'm proud of, and which history will record, were important things. And they were things that wouldn't have happened automatically. They happened because there were leaders who were prepared to lead. <clears throat> and Peter Drucker, I think, the great management guru, once made the remark that management is doing things right, but leadership is doing the right things. And they were doing the right things, those leaders, and I include in that uh, Zhang Zemin. And uh, therefore, I do not believe that historic events generally occur because of some ill-defined inevitability. They are, in significant reasons, for good and ill, influenced massively by individuals. And even in concluding the Uruguay round, which was the biggest moment in my life, an agreement of 22,000 pages, believe it or not, which has brought about huge change in global trade, that could not have happened if we had two bad apples in the four or five key countries, particularly, historically, India and Brazil, played a wrecking game in international trade. But they were both led by individuals who at that time wanted to get an agreement. And <clears throat> now we have to see whether two countries step up to the mark with regard to the Doha round. And those two countries, in my opinion, who have to lead are the United States and China. Whether they will lead or not is in the lap of the gods. They're meeting at the moment in terms of trying to overcome their difficulties. But if either of, either of them resign from what we are doing, we will be in a position where it will not happen. So I'll conclude by saying that I think the greatest leaders move and work with a clear and defined purpose. And I think they do it more effectively and efficiently if it is a moral purpose. In 1950, at a meeting in the Geneva Circle, Adenar de Gasperi, Schumann, met with Monet under the auspices of this Geneva Circle and they spoke and later wrote of a moral purpose binding them to great events. And in a way they attacked an idea that went back to 1583 when Baudin wrote of de la Republique, Republique, 
wrote of the creation of the idea of national sovereignty. They went back to an idea which later Jacques Delors was to talk of in terms of Europe and his adventure seeking, as he said, a soul for Europe. A soul for Europe that transcended national identity. If in the next 10 years we have not injected a spirit of belief in a soul for Europe that tramples on the appalling nonsense of tabloid headlines that disparage other peoples, then if we do not, if we haven't injected this dimension into Europe, the game will be up and the world will be a much worse place for it. Jacques Delors saw all of this. That's why he was the author of The Single Currency, something which some with a certain schadenfreude look upon now as a failure which they will be delighted to see. Well, they won't see it because it will survive but it'll survive because people are determined that this whole experiment cannot die. J.K. Galbraith said that all the great leaders have had one characteristic in common. It was the willingness to confront unequivocally the major anxiety of their peoples in their time. This, he said, and not much else, is the essence of leadership. He echoes the words of Balthazar Gratian, who wrote the greatest book of wisdom, according to Nietzsche, The Art of Worldly Wisdom, who said, the rarest individuals depend upon their times. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you uh, very much for that extraordinary, thoughtful and, and human um, uh, way in which you sort of took us in and through the corridors of, uh, of Europe and the places that you've been. We've got a few minutes for that, for questions. Can we, uh, yeah, can I just hold on one second? Thank you. I'd like to ask, um, where do you feel the European Union could rise up to the ambitions of a Treaty of Lisbon, thinking in particular the dramatic uh, developments occurring in North Africa? I'd rather not have to put up with boys' own nonsenses in the Libyan desert. Thank you. Well, I'd, I think that the European Union um, has even after the Treaty of Lisbon, has extremely limited competence. Now, I regret this, but I think it's inevitable that it is going to be the last part of the integration process if we ever reach it, namely of taking a common position in regard to issues of foreign policy and defense. I think it's difficult to envisage Britain, uh, France, and so on, giving up their positions on the Security Council and replacing them with this common European voice. And it may be easy for me to say that they should do so as an Irishman who wouldn't be likely to have much uh, opportunity to say anything at a Security Council. So I don't think, I think we badly need a common position. I think that, there are, that, that the evidence of that isn't too, um, too clearly available in regard to recent events in Egypt, Tunisia, and, and Libya. Um, and I think that that's very regrettable. And we re the result is that we have the rather pathetic individual member state positions being taken in a way which doesn't really work. So I'm afraid I'm not an optimist.
you're suggesting that circumstances create leaders and unfortunately those leaders become afterwards such ordinary human being. Can you think of a leader that can create a change apart from God? This is a reflective question. The other question is, you're talking about the virtue of Christianity and you link it with the dignity of man. Yes, Europe, in my opinion, prospered between the two, years war, uh, two world wars and before that as well. But look at the ex uh, what they did to other societies. They took their dignity, they looted them, and the, works, the worst dark age was the Holocaust. So where is the virtue here? And where is the dignity of man? Thank you. I think, I think that Europe has displayed some of the greatest contradictions to the dignity of man and the equality of man. We fostered uh, slavery for a long period of time and we have been responsible for dreadful events like the Holocaust. So I'm not saying that there has been a victory in Europe of the principles which I believe underpin Christianity. But yeah, but the virtues, which, what I do believe is that the virtues which Christianity espouses is the only thing that stands between us and a much deeper abyss. And I think it is still there and I think it has done good in many respects. Um, so those who, who don't believe in Christianity believe that Europe fostered, which it did, the Enlightenment, which fosters many of the values of humanism, which one can say are the same as Christian values. I happen to believe that the Enlightenment in many ways came from the thinking which was inherent in the whole concept of Christianity and other religions. I'm not saying it's a uniquely Christian thing, but I don't think, I don't think Christianity has been a success in Europe, uh, anything but. It has, it, has, uh, it has prevailed in a society which has done many evil things, but it's still proclaiming the truth and the right, uh, at least as I see it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about how you think leadership will change with the advent of WikiLeaks and social media, as we've seen in the Middle East. There's been a shift of power from leaders to the people, and how you think that will impact modern leaders. Thank you. Well, first of all, I have to make a confession that I would much prefer to have been born and to have lived in a society which never had any WikiLeaks and probably never even had a television. So I would be quite happy, I would be quite happy with a, a much more a primitive society. And I think your question is excellent. And it's so excellent that it's one of the questions that I hate being asked because I, have, <laughs> because I haven't a clue what the answer is. I have a sort of a, uh, I have a schizophrenic reaction to WikiLeaks. On the one hand, I believe in transparency and uh, <clears throat> the triumph of good over evil in the context of transparency rather than hiding things. On the other hand, I can see that it can create great negatives, have great negative effects um, and probably already has had in terms of allowing <coughs> some information which was better kept under wraps, uh, views, opinions of others, and peoples and so on. So uh, I think on balance that my view is that the advent of WikiLeaks was a negative rather than a positive. But. Peter, thank you very much. I think, uh, I think you've given us a lot to think about. Um, I'm particularly delighted because those of you who have been following our lectures um, through, we have been trying to look to the moral dimension to the nature of both the leadership and in the term before the issues facing the financial crisis uh, that, that we have gone through. And again, Peter was stressing to us just how important it is to have some, uh, to have a, not just a moral underpinning or undergirding, which you know all of us would think is probably a good idea, 
but those who actually passionately believe and are prepared to act on what they believe to be a moral cause uh, and a buying in to something much bigger than themselves. Peter, again, thank you very much indeed for being with us.